Hello, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Brian Williams. I'm joined here with Dr. Marcus Noyes. We are going to be discussing some contact lens fitting for post-surgical complications, all, all sorts of scleral lenses that you could fit on a post-surgical cornea or other complications that you might see. Okay, these, this is my background. I undergrad Texas Tech, University of Houston for optometry school, and then I did my cornea contact lens residency in Birmingham at the UAB School of Optometry. I have no financial disclosures with this lecture. I'm gonna turn it over to Marcus. My background is I am from Iowa. I went to the University of Northern Iowa undergrad, UH for optometry school with classmates with Brian here. Um, did residency at Ohio State University at the Wexner Medical Center. And now I'm at the University of Iowa. And I also have no financial disclosures. So take it away, Brian. Awesome. So. The kind of layout of the lecture today, we have a few different objectives that we're going to try to reach. You, kind of specific here, but overarching theme is we're going to try to manage with uh, post-surgical, just complications can be of any type. That can be a corneal surgery, that can be any sort of uh, anexa surgery, and how we are going to manage that with scleral lenses, or in some cases, how we determine that scleral lenses would not be indicated in, in one of one of Marcus's cases, but um, I will kind of save you from reading through all of those bullet points specifically. We'll start off with kind of one of the more softball, if you will, uh, post-surgical cases. This is something I'm sure many, if you're fitting scleral lenses long enough, I'm sure many people will see a case of post-refractive surgery gone wrong or, or post-refractive surgery in this case a little was not enough at all, apparently, for a, a patient that Dr. Noyes um, so kindly shared with me. This, these are his photos. Um, but this is one where you'll see quite a bit of uh, post-radial keratotomy surgery, so we'll get right into it. So this patient was sent to me by a corneal specialist, um, and actually kind of in conjunction that you'll see in just a second, another optometrist as well, for the primary concern of just blurred vision at all distances that they thought could uh, sharpen up a little bit. So she was a 58 year old white female. She had bilateral RK surgery back in the nineties. Um, she has some dry eye syndrome as well too, that we were hoping to get at least managed a little bit better. Only other real kind of um, component with the eyes, at least pathology wise uh, was some early cataracts. Um, We'll go to the next slide. That's the medical history that you can see there. Um, thyroid and Sjogren's syndrome definitely contributing a little bit to the inflammation and ocular surface disease component in this patient. Um, high blood pressure, cholesterol. One interesting thing of note with this patient is she was actually hospitalized in 2021 for complications related to COVID. Coming out of that, she had a whole lot of binocular vision and um, just balance issues that she was actually being followed by a neurooptometrist for. So lots of um, kind of prism glasses and type things that we were gonna have to also take into account whenever we were fitting uh, the lenses on this patient. Her acuities coming in with glasses were a pretty shaky 2040, 2050, passing the Texas driver's license down here. The line that you have to read is 2040. So she was really kind of skating by with that. Um, even though she wasn't driving at this time after the, the COVID complications. But if you can take a look there, her um, habitual spectacle prescription, as is the case with a lot of um, post-radial keratotomy patients, their prescription after surgery oftentimes tends to shift far into the hyperopic direction. Um, you can see more so in that left eye than the right eye, creating quite a bit of anisometropia for this patient as well, too. So glasses, albeit somewhat um, needed for her kind of binocular vision component, definitely weren't providing her much functional vision um, with the, the amount of prescription that you'd have to dial into that. If you can imagine putting some prism with that as well, too, really thick glasses that we'd be dealing with. So contacts great option for this patient. You can see her um, keratometry and pachymetry readings there. Very thin cornea post-surgical. 
Um, and you have some, those are her max Ks, but as you see in a second with her penicam findings, you can just see very irregular corneas there. Only other thing of note, um, it's high exophoria, which we kind of discussed. So slit lamp findings, a little bit of MGD. She had 16 cut RK and those cataracts that we had mentioned previously. Everything else posterior segment was within normal limits. So this is her uh, penicam. Um, as you can tell, just Post RK, you had that degree of flattening initially, and then it just kind of drops off that cliff where she's had some ectasia start to form. And the tricky part about these as well, too, is that even in some mild cases where you might have an RK patient that can get some somewhat functional vision with much lower degrees of, of uh, spectacle correction like this patient had, a big issue with these patients is their prescription just fluctuates like crazy. You might refract them at 9 a.m. and then at 3 p.m. and you could have two very different prescriptions. So that's a really frustrating part about these that scleral lenses can really help with. You can see the left eye, very similar, a little bit higher magnitude of the flat kind of central component of the cornea and then steepening in that inferior component. So the first lens that we um, wanted to go with for this patient, uh, she was driving in a bit of a way. So I usually always give my patients the option at least if I think I could get it pretty pretty nailed either way of a diagnostic lens fitting or a topography uh, guided lens fit. This patient was driving quite a ways and she wanted to cut down on as many follow-up visits as possible. So we decided to use um, an SMAP designed lens. So if you're not familiar with an SMAP 3D to, uh, scleral topographer, what you do is you map out the, the sclera of an eye in three different gazes. It gets out to about 21 millimeters, roughly, in terms of the data set that it collects. And we use that scan to actually design the first lens for the patient. So what so you want Brian, to do is, yeah, go for are it. You, are you saying that you're ordering lenses empirically for these patients just based off of their scleral propylometry? Yes and no. So we we will put on, I'll, I'll put on a Europa lens in office as well too, to gauge what their over refraction is and, and see how close to it, is, how close the fit is. Um, but I'll rely almost entirely for the fit data and parameters off what the um, SMAP scan says. So cool. yes and no, I guess, is that if that's answering your question. Yeah, great. Um, thanks. So yeah, so those, the Europa trial lenses on the left, those were purely just for an over-refraction. I think as you'll see in some of Marcus's cases later, you, that could even really be an RGP and you could go purely empirical off of this. It doesn't even necessarily need to be a scleral. Really the info you're looking for there is just a base curve power in the lens and an over-refraction. So once I determined that those were stable enough to get an over-refraction, I ordered the lenses based off of the SMAP scan, and then we were gonna bring the patient back whenever the lenses got in for application removal training. So this is a image or images of the scans that we take. Like I said before, this is just the right eye. Uh, you take a central scan where their they're kind of gaze is straight ahead, then you take an up and a down. That splices those images together, like you can see on the right over there. Um, and that will really kind of create a very highly customized lens design for this patient where all of those peripheral curves are freeform matched to the curvature and the contours of the sclera of the patient. So pretty, pretty cool technology here. Left eye, very similar, three different gazes, splicing of those images and matching up that um, sclera real well. So the first fit um, of that latitude lens and what the lens manufacturers at Visionary Optics usually really stress is to make minimal changes at the very first dispensive visit. Even if you see uh, some minor things that you would wanna change, in this case, I really didn't. I was pretty happy with the result other than a little bit of over refraction in the left eye. Um, they really want to allow these lenses to settle onto the eye and get matched up over the course of a week or two um, before you want to make any big changes. Because oftentimes how you initially dispense these lenses, once they kind of get into their lockstep type fit, though they can oftentimes settle very comfortably and, and very um, effectively. Um, but between both lenses here, the first dispense was between kind of 275 and 300 microns central clearance. The limbus had adequate clearance, no concerns there, and the landing zone matching up that contour of the sclera was great. Just a little bit of that 
plus one over a fraction, like I said, in the, in the left eye. Yeah, Brian, I think that's a great point too, that you, that you brought up right there, which if you look at the, the right eye, the patient had a plano over refraction with 2030, whereas the left, there was a plus one that got them to 2025. I personally, almost every time, if, if there's a small over refraction on the first dispense, never try and add it in Yeah, wait for the lens to settle and then see what it's like on the follow-up. I've had a lot of people who kind of chase their own tail by trying to get the yeah. over refraction nailed down before the fit. It's got to be pretty egregious. I mean, if I way overshoot them and they're, let's say, like plus 150 in both eyes instead of one, and the lenses just visually aren't very functional for them at distance or near without really cranking in some reading glasses, then maybe I'll, I'm more inclined to get something ordered right off the bat just to give them something more functional visually. But it's got to be pretty high. And those yeah. instances are pretty rare unless you're just so far off with your initial <laughs> over a fraction, which I hope is not the case for. No, for, I've been there. Happens. That's I'm there. Usually it happens. <laughs> no. But yeah, great point. Great point. Okay. So first follow-up visit, you can see um, after four hours of wear time, the patient reported that she's very happy with her vision and comfort and the lenses having a little bit of issues. Um, she, I can't remember if I put this in here. She was having a little bit of issues in terms of just application removal type things. I think some of that was in her head. She was a very um, cautious, kind of anxious patient where she was a little bit hesitant to really get in and, and get after it with the lens. Um, but that really is a reflex that I see people can really train down over time. So I was really confident she was going to be a good um, candidate for these moving forward. The right eye, you can see settled in just a little bit, not as much as the left eye whenever you're talking about that central clearance going from the 275 range down to about 230-ish in the right eye, 175 to 200 in the left eye, but still great lumbo clearance. Landing zones were awesome in both sides. That left eye stayed pretty consistent with that over a fraction. So at that point, I was more inclined to give her that plus one, plus one and a quarter to help out and balance out that vision for her. So that was the plan here. Um, yeah, I just want to clarify what we were just talking about, where you checked the over refraction first, didn't apply it, you waited until the follow up, then mm -hmm. when you confirm that over refraction is stable, that's when you added it. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, sir. So these are a, a picture of the, the lenses on eye, you can almost see the, the RK cuts pretty faintly. Um, in the left eye there. So looking at this lens, you have right eye on kind of how you would look at it through the slit lamp. Um, but the left eye, you can see those faint RK cuts and, and just the lens on eye. I tried to splice these together best I can here. I'm no, uh, th this actually was not taken with a Google Pixel, Marcus, if you can believe it. I can believe it because they would be spliced perfectly if they were. So. You're probably right. So that's case one, like I said, kind of a softball one. We'll start to, the, the goal here is to ramp up slowly until we get to Marcus's bizarro world of, of eyeballs that he sees on a daily basis. So this one's a little bit more outside the box in terms of what your, your standard cornea surgical patients that you see that I see a decent amount of, but this patient had a blepharoplasty surgery that just took a little bit too much of the eyelids away and, and kind of ended up with not so great result here. So, all right. So this patient was sent to me um, by another optometrist that was following her, trying her with just the kitchen sink of dry eye components for that just was not getting a lot of great success with. So she had severe dryness in both eyes, 71 year old white female. She, like I said before, she had had a blepharoplasty on both of her upper eyelids and now was having a real difficult time closing or making a complete closure. So a lot of this was exposure related, but the patient definitely had some meibomian gl gland um, dysfunction and has that similar to the last patient, the thyroid eye dis or thyroid disease along with rheumatoid arthritis, just a lot of those autoimmune inflammatory components that were affecting her as well too. Um, like I said, she had tried a whole lot of things before, Regenerize being the most recent one that she had been using, but even before that, the Tria, the Zydra, Restasis, Sequa, Autologous Serum Tears, she had came to me trying all of those without much success before. 
Um, vision wise, really unaided is seeing pretty well. So this isn't one of those huge wow factors for patients of putting on a lens and saying, oh my goodness, my vision is much better. But even in this case, trying to stabilize some of that, that ocular surface disease in a lens, she was able to see a, a whole lot better just with the quality of her vision. So not a whole lot of a spectacle prescription there. You can see here though, with uh, those, those steep Ks and the pachymetry, that she's definitely got something going on with that cornea, whether it be, and we'll, we'll take a look at those in the penicam here in just a bit. So a whole lot of meibomian gland dysfunction. This patient was also a very heavy makeup wear that we'll, we'll see in just a little bit leads to, I'm sure Marcus, you can attest to some very difficult conversations sometimes whenever you start having to talk makeup in, in the exam room, which nowhere near my forte. Marcus will oh. be a little bit better in yours. I was going to say the opposite. They look at most people when I walk in the room, they say, that, no, 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 I want to see the doctor, not a hobo. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. You, you're you're like the stylish guy. So I feel like for me, it's like they probably don't think I've ever even seen makeup before. Well, you had your eyeliner days back in undergrad. So that was, <laughs> it was you know. girl pants, no eyeliner. Okay, sure. Continue. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Well, incomplete blanks were the main component of what I was seeing behind the slit lamp there. So Really, I have a video here in a little bit, um, but that was leading to a whole lot of exposure dryness on that inferior portion of her cornea that even started to have some scarring. Um, other than that, going behind the anterior segment, a little bit of cataract formation, 71 years old, kind of what you would expect. And then her fundus was all within normal limits. So this was her Pentacam scan. Um, kind of tough to get a good quality image for her. Um, that dryness can really affect some of your, your data sets at times. So one thing, just troubleshooting with this, always try to tell my techs, if you're getting really poor image scans, you, you can see a lot of those uh, coming up with some kind of yellow indicators there. But uh, get, having a drop set or a artificial tear set right there at the Pentacam um, and, and still in some drops to try to smooth out that surface for these really severe ocular, ocular surface disease patients can sometimes get a little bit more quality scans, but you can kind of tell that the inferior components of this cornea has that steepening and where they kind of start to, to drop off a little bit. So this patient is another one that um, opted for an SMAP scan. This one was more so I, I usually tell patients if I think that an SMAP would be far worth the investment in it, not only was she driving a little bit of ways, I think round trip for her was about an hour and a half each way. But with the small fornix that she was going to be working with, I was really concerned with being able to map out a good quality lens for her. and the amount of just scarring and irregularity. I mean, it was her contour of her sclera just did not look very regular. And I was I was confident we could get to a, a good landing spot, but the S map is definitely a tool I, I fall back on quite a bit if I'm trying to get to that end spot and cut down on the amount of follow-up visits much sooner. Um, so similar to before, threw on some Europa trial lenses for uh, over refraction purposes. With very, uh, it was kind of funny. She only took minus a quarter in office, so really good trial run for of how the lenses would feel and relieve some of her symptoms and kind of give her an idea of what her vision would be like too. So um, her goal was for monovision with contact. She wanted to limit her uh, dependence on reading glasses. So that was the over fraction we shot for and sent the lenses through. Question for you. Yeah. When uh, So you mentioned the small fornices, which as most people who know me know, I'm totally on the side of bigger lenses over smaller lenses. Yeah. Small fornices, you still got a 16 millimeter lens. That's like a pretty, a lot of people would call that big. Was that it, something it, It's that... a decent, it's a decent size for sure. That's kind of the standard that um, Visionary goes with whenever you're ordering off an S-map. I was talking, you'll see her scan here in a little bit. I was able to pry those lids open. If you even want to go to the next slide. I was able to get her lids at least pried open a decent amount. So you can see some um, decent coverage here, um, or at least scleral show here. The In consultation with, um, I, I think it might have been Belinda at Visionary, she thought that 16 would be a decent starting point for um, 
the the lens, but you, you I don't I don't know if that was a, a plant question, but you'll see here in just a little bit. This was her SMAP scans, right eye, left eye. We kind of went through this before, but the initial dispense um, went okay. I mean, in office was perfectly fine. I got the lenses in for her, no issue. Uh, doing application and removal, she struggled quite a bit. We ended up opting for a gel tier um, to try to minimize the amount of bubbles and things like that. And almost kind of ended up going with kind of the envelope type approach where you go kind of get up underneath the upper lid, almost like you're doing your eye print impression kind of thing where you get it under one lid and then you try to tuck it underneath the other lid as best you can. But she left at least pretty confident with the ability to get these in and out on her own. She didn't leave with much eye makeup on after that appointment, that's for sure. So this that was kind of a good um, teaching tool for her saying really load up on the eye makeup after the lens. Otherwise, you're going to get some gunky lenses and a lot of um, cloudy tear reservoir, but we had that talk and she learned the hard way at this one. But like we said before, initial dispense of this lens, um, adequate clearance, adequate limbal zone, the, the landing zone looked like it was in good shape for the most part. Happy with her near vision and that left eye like we shot for for mono vision. So we had, we had a pretty good initial result leaving. Downside of things, here, here comes a little bit of the, the complicated side. So um, she called in a few days later saying that she had not yet successfully been able to get the lenses in on her own. She thought that herself would be a little bit more successful if she went with a smaller contact lens design. So I got back on the phone with uh, Visionary Optics and just said, how small do you think we could go with a lens based off the SMAP scan that we took? So um, they thought they could still adequately go down to a 15 millimeter lens and still get enough coverage and still be able to match the contours based off the scan. So that's what we went with. Um, we had her come back in for a new dispense of these lenses. And we also reviewed the application removal for her as well. Okay. Um, so this, this was the dispense of those smaller lenses. Again, I got them in pretty well. She thought that with this lens, she did a whole lot better in terms of uh, application and removal training. And this time, we I don't know if you've done this much, Marcus, but we actually ended up dispensing her a very diluted concentration of uh, preparacane that trying to get that reaction down. Very strict instructions that she was not allowed to use it anything more than... Um, twice a day whenever she was planning and then try to wean that off after a week. So I was calling this patient every other day, um, but trying to get that ability of, of putting the lens in and down. But um, that's happened twice where I've had to end up going with, with the prepare gain solution because she was very difficult getting lenses in. But she got them in. This was the, the lenses on her eyes. If you want to take a look at these. So that's her blink whenever I'm telling her just to normal, relax, normal blink. And as you can see, just very, you can almost see the scar tissue through the lens on that inferior component of the cornea. Um, you can even go left eye as well too, it's pretty similar. Even a little bit less. So she's very clear on that pupil on most of her blinks there in the left eye. All right, but with the lenses in place, she was reporting comfortable, clear vision, and she called a, about a week later. She This one is still in the process of, of a follow-up visit, but about a week later, she said she was much more adept at putting the lenses in, taking them out, and they were working pretty well for her. So third case here, this is not my patient. Um, if he had these on, he probably would have saved himself quite a bit of trouble, but this is a, a kind of a work injury gone wrong here. So this patient was sent to me by a cornea specialist. Um, he had suffered a full thickness corneal laceration in his right eye a few months before and then had a subsequent repair. Um, he had a whole lot of symptoms related to that light sensitivity, blurred vision, uh, and he was currently being co-managed by a, a cornea specialist that finally had cut him loose um, after all of the inflammation and, and um, kind of healing had 
taken a little bit further place and was ready for a, a lens to be fit. So his unaided vision in that right eye somehow looking through a whole lot of stitches and scarring was still about 2,500. Um, we we're only going to focus on that right eye. Pinhole was no improvement for him. Um, and the, the prescription was kind of negligible for him. Other than the very large kind of full thickness scarring that you could see in his right eye, it pretty much extended from four o'clock superior temporally all the way across the cornea going in nasally and kind of ran right into where a very large pinguecula was for him as well too. So just creating a lot of irregular surface that not only went from his cornea right into his uh, sclera conge as well too. So this is his um, pentacam for his right eye. You can see it just goes from very steep to very flat following the kind of line of where that incision was. So this one was another one that I almost didn't even give an option of a, a diagnostic fitting. I, I just, the area around his nasal conge was so irregular from the scar tissue and where he already had a very large pinguecula that I, I didn't think we would get anywhere near a decent result uh, without starting off with, or, or we, Potentially could, we got real complicated or real creative, but SMAP I thought would get to a, an end result much, much quicker. So similar to the previous two, took an SMAP scan. Um, the, the pictures here really don't do it justice, I would say, from the SMAP scan in terms of the density of the scar and where that nasal pinguecula is. You can almost see on that inferior 3D visualization, that superior to inferior component, that little hump there of where the, the scar tissue goes into, um, but you'll, you can see it a little bit better on some future pictures. So the lens right there, you can almost see it's, again, we're, we're ramping up here. So take this with a grain of salt as you get used to Marcus's lenses that are like this on the sclera. Um, but you can see that little bit of where the, the pinguecula and scar tissue goes into nasally. Um, the iris even had some uh, damage and trauma to it, too, from that, that full thickness laceration of that work injury that he had. Um, but really with the lens on that we designed, it's really contouring that nasal sclera very well. Um, and the initial comfort dispensing the lens to the patient he was happy with. Um, the biggest issue that he had was still a little bit of light sensitivity. We ended up wanting to fit glasses for this patient anyways, just so we could get protection for his left eye. So he was wearing a tinted pair of glasses full time that he could do kind of a Plano progressive where it's Plano at the top and then went down. So he could at least have some protection of his now good eye while wearing the, the lens for the right eye. So that was his dispense appointment. Um, the initial fit looked great. I was really pleased with the result from the, the SMAP scan design. Um, and then we completed uh, application removal training and had him come back a couple weeks later. So at this point, the, the fit looked awesome. Um, this is when he was still very photophobic. So by this point, we were close to getting his um, glasses fit for him. So he was picking up the, the glasses at this time as well too. And in office, he was very happy with the result in terms of a photophobia standpoint. So we kicked him out a little bit longer and I don't think I had seen him by the time I made these lenses. Oh, nope, I had. Um, so this was kind of where we, we kicked it down to a six month follow-up for him, but from a fit standpoint, combined with his tinted glasses was doing really great. So this is up, down, left, right. Um, probably could have benefited from a pixel here with these pictures, but uh, the main one, I, the biggest area of irregularity was definitely the, where you see the um, kind of neon color right over there is where it's really contouring, where the it, looking at it underneath the microscope was far more elevated, far more inflamed. So the, the visionary optics people did a great job mapping that out for sure. This is where the, the big dog comes in. <laughs> hey, we're co we're co dogs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, I'm Brian. That was that was great. One thing that I think is that people don't pay enough attention to the lids, like the post bluffs and everything. Yeah. Like that, that you had. So I'm really glad you included one of those in there. 
but yes, uh, we'll we'll kind of switch gears here slightly. Where these are a couple of cases um, that I, that I've seen here recently. Case number one is called PKs tubes and acanthamoeba slash mycotic super infection, or otherwise known as your worst nightmare and mine also. So case history with this patient, I had a 20 year old female referred from the cornea service for a scleral lens evaluation. She had decreased vision, dryness, and her ocular history was positive for a lot of things here. Acanthamoeba, fungal ulcer, PK, amblyopia, angle closure glaucoma, and two glaucoma surgeries. Systemic medications were not really contributory, but she was on artificial tears, glaucoma drops, PRED, autologous serum, basically everything to try and keep her ocular service healthy and with her eye pressure down low. Her visual acuity on initial exam was 2070 and 2060, pinhole to 2040, 2050, and she did have an irregular pupil that was not reacted to light in the right eye. Everything else was pretty much normal. On slit lamp examination, her right eye, the big takeaway here was she had a PK with peripheral neovascularization, also central superficial haze, but her epi is intact. Her left eye, she has superior and inferior tube shunts, and then also has PK with clumps of irregular astigmatism, a multifocal dendritiform pattern and some vessels coming in inside the graph too. So here are some pictures. This is when she presented or um, when she first started, you can see the PK there with that central haze and that is due to a fungal infection co-infected with acanthamoeba. You can also see in the background, particularly on that right picture, her irregular pupil um, from all of the inflammation. Her left eye, First off, I just want to point out how large that PK is. It's a huge, huge um, keratoplasty. And then in this photo, she actually only has one tube, which I have pointed out with that uh, with that arrow there. And then her epi was actually intact, despite what that photo looks like. That's just what she presented like after having this acanthamoeba and fungal co-infection. What's, what's your main concerns whenever you're talking small PK versus larger PK? As that, that button starts getting closer to the limbus, is that something that starts raising some yellow flags or red flags for you whenever you're fitting? Yeah, it gets tough because every time you do a PK, the repeat one has a higher chance of failing, but also you have to make it bigger than the one before. So as you can see here, we're already out to almost the limbus, so if she needs another PK, there's not a lot of um, host tissue there to work with. Um, continuing on, um, for her, we, I had to over refract her with RGPs um, because there was no scleral that could fit over the tube. And then we fit her with an impression-based design similar to what Brian's lens looked like. I got a really weird wonky <laughs> looking lens that came out of it. And that's the lens of the left eye. So here's the right eye with the scleral fit over top. Again, you can see that irregular pupil and still a large PK there. Um, the original fit, this was on the dispensing day. You can see the there is clearance. There are about 130 microns there. It gets down to maybe less than 100, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm just happy there was clearance at all to begin with. And then for the left eye, Here's a picture with both tubes. I have them highlighted by those blue arrows there. I hope you can see that inferior one through zoom. But this is with the that curvy scleral lens over top of it. And as you can see, it, it fits like a glove. Those are those are Google Pixel, I'm assuming. <laughs> I don't remember, but if it looks good, then yes. <laughs> um, so left eye. That initial dispense had 350 microns of clearance. Again, I'm just happy it's clearing the cornea at all. And then here I want to point out, this is an OCT showing the tube. So fitting tubes is really tricky. You have to make sure there's plenty of vault because you can see that tissue over top of the tube is pretty thin. Using our little key on the far right hand side of the screen we're with 250 microns, it looks like it's less than that over top the tube. So this is something we'd want to be very, watch closely and try and prevent tube erosion. 
Um, here is the other tube, the inferior tube, which as I have highlighted there in the blue, you can see there's way, way more tissue over top of that tube. So we we're less concerned of, with that one on the left eye. Um, so when she came back three months later, the tube erosion that she had before, there's where the tube is, is pretty much gone. The arrow right there is highlighting the sclera did thin out to get pretty thin, maybe even 50 microns or less. But look at all of this conjunctival tissue over top of it now. The conj actually remodeled itself with the overvaulting over the tubes to fill in the gaps and actually prevented a superior tube erosion. So we had some final lens parameters for, for her here. Um, she was fit with impression-based lenses, wildly different prescriptions, and obviously a high DK lens. And she was able to achieve 2025 and 2030 vision. Um, this was a great life-changing moment for her. She was able to go to college, um, which she wasn't able to do previously, and um, study, drive. She got her license, all that stuff, doing really well for a year and a half when her graphs started rejecting. And then she needed another PK on the right eye. And of course, the graft got microbial keratitis and HSP co-infection. And then the left eye starts failing too. So as of right now, she's stuck out of her sclerals at 2150 and 2600 with no correction, waiting for some healing to happen. So hopefully we can refit her again. But the main point that I, I wanted to uh, make here was sometimes you do a great fit and things just don't work out. You can't forget about the eye underneath the fit. And sometimes it's just out of your control. So this is the last time she came in. She was looking like this, which led to something like that. And to be determined if we can fit her in another lens. But um, hopefully she she does very well. So Real why would I that one before? So if you're coming in with your clearance in that right eye, I guess, like you were saying before, that's just something you kind of le live with. If it ends up coming down and resting gently on a PK patient like that, not something you're trying to tweak to get a little bit higher clearance, a little bit lower. No, So I, I would tweak it to get a higher clearance. Um, but just on the initial dispense, she was yeah. someone who just needed it kind of like right now. Yeah. So we dispensed it like that anyway, and I don't have a picture, but we did actually increase the clearance a bit. Okay. Tune up the yeah. fit, make sure everything looks good. Gotcha. Yep. So a lot, sometimes people ask, why do why a scleral lens on this patient? Why, why couldn't this patient do a GP? That's what most people do with tubes or with blebs. So first off, if you have a uh, GP, you can desiccate the cornea and limbus. The, the lens can only has a limited area of movement with the GP because you don't want it to rub into the bleb or the tubes. And so you can actually get areas of uh, dryness or desiccation next to the RG next to the bleb where the RGP wouldn't travel. Scleral obviously vaults over top of that and hydrates the whole ocular surface. Also patient comfort. And then as we saw in this case, it can actually help remodel tube erosion, which can be um, huge. You just have to make sure that you're you're fitting it very carefully with a lot of follow-up. So as for risks and alternatives, the, the risks are without impression-based fitting, it's very, very difficult to have a proper fit over a tube. Um, empirical fitting, like Brian was doing with um, SMAP or other sorts of scleral profilometry, can help, but still you have to be de very careful. Um, and then also the patient's eye is fragile with everything she's been through. So you really got to make sure that the INR is crystal clear for those patients. As for alternatives, RGP is really the only other option here. Um, but like I said, we we chose, we elected to do a, a scleral instead for the reasons on the previous slide. So lessons here, make sure to overvault your tubes and blebs. That will allow the conj to kind of remodel and settle in those areas prevent things like tube erosion. And then always you have to remember, you can have graft failure independently of your scleral fit. You have to treat the eye and try and match what's going on there rather than just trying to get a perfect fit every time. Uh, moving on to the second case here. Um, this, this case I, I have titled fitting the ectatic graft, which I think is something that everyone who's 
delving into scleral lenses has done at least once or twice. So for this patient, case history was a 65 year old um, male from with keratoconus after PK in both eyes is referred to us from the cornea service. His chief complaint is he doesn't want surgery. <laughs> He was kind of one of those redneck types, you know, uh, 65 years old, only goes to the doctor when his eyes falling out type deal. And th that was his, his verbatim sentence when I said, what can I do for you today? I don't want surgery. I was like, okay. <laughs> so his ocular history was positive for a penetrating keratoplasty back in the 70s. So he's had it for like 50 years, which I thought was pretty crazy. Um, also cataracts and keratoconus. His exam findings, he was 2060-ish in the right eye and 2300 with his glasses correction. And he had a thick pachymetry of 660 and 735 in the right and left eyes. Everything else was normal except for the cell count, but that was unreliable. We couldn't get accurate information on it. So going to the right eye, we noticed uh, cornea, there's the PK, like I mentioned, the graphs are very thin and attatic. And the same exact thing on the left eye, although there was a, a diagnosis of keratoglobus on the left. Patient also had grade three cataracts in both eyes. Not the person that you typically want to try and fit. So here are some slit lamp photos of the right and left eyes. The red arrow I have on the left-hand side of the screen is pointing out some of that neovascularization. The blue arrow or teal or whatever color that is, is pointing out the um, decimase folds or just folds in the PK from it, the level of ectasia, presumably. And then the green arrows, both on the right and left eyes are pointing out some corneal scarring. Here's this pentacam image, which as you can see, looks crazy. But the main takeaway I wanted you to um, see here was that his K-max was about 76 in the right eye, highly irregular. And that is the OCT image of what the right eye looked like. You can see just how thin it is um, over on the right-hand side there. And then here is his Pentacam data for the left eye, where he's not quite as ectatic by this measurement. But as you'll see in the next picture here, he's extremely, extremely thin, especially on that left-hand side, going almost sub 100 microns there. So his exam findings, he was 2040 with an RGP overrefraction in the right eye and uh, 2025 with a scler scleral overrefraction in the left. Unfortunately, after repeated um, endo cell count measurements and the instability of his graft and just how long he's had those, they were in the 1970s, he's a pretty poor candidate for sclerals. So this was a time when we actually elected to not do sclerals for a patient like this. And try and then, go ahead. Hey there, can you get into a little bit more of what's your your magic number for an endothelial cell count, or do you have one, or do you kind of just bird's eye view the whole scenario, taking into account the graft and everything like that? Yeah, great, great question, great point. So uh, I typically like to do the bird's eye view when things start getting low, down around 600, 400, things like that. That's when I the red, yellow, red flags really start popping up. But as you know. It does definitely depend on a lot more than just the endo cell count. Haziness of the graft, um, how well can patients tolerate it? You know, there's a lot there. But great. I'm glad you brought that up, Brian. So kind of flipping through here, what, what we decided to do was I, I used an impression-based gas permeable lens. So the, the EPGP or eye print gas permeable. Um, shout out to David at iPrint. Thanks for this, this um, photo. But this is, we did an impression-based design and actually created an RGP based off of the cornea. And you can see, even just from these images, how weird and irregular it is. Even on that bottom one, the left-hand side of the RGP goes further down or inferiorly in this photo than it does on the right-hand side. So just a highly irregular GP there. And this was his dispense with the initial lenses. There's the right eye, which as you can see, it's moving on that cornea translating. Um, you can see the fluorescein is moving, even though it looks like kind of there might be some bearing. That's more of just we needed to apply some more fluorescein. But overall, I was happy with that for a fit. And then the left eye here, we added some more fluorescein in, but you can see 
perfect translation on the cornea centering and has that nice fluorescein pattern. So I'll play those one more time here. Excellent. So his final lens parameters were the impression-based um, EPGP gas perms with the parameters there. And he actually got to 2025 in the right eye and 2020 in the left. So this was one of those that felt like a Hail Mary, but it ended up working. And so it, I guess at one, just when those happen, it makes you look cool, but it feels like it's pretty rare. So the, the key points from this is there's always new technology coming out in the specialty lens world. And just because uh, sclerals have so much potential for so many patients, don't forget about some of your other lens types like GPs and, and the new novel technology involved with those as well. Also, never hurts to try. Like I said, this feel, feel like a felt field. This felt like a Hail Mary, but it ended up working. So I always will tell patients right off the bat, hey, I don't know if this is going to work, but if you're willing to try, we can give it a shot. All right, last case here, congenital ectodermal dysplasia secondary to Charlie M syndrome. And that's my face as well during this. Uh, so let me just give you a couple um, of the of the basics here. Con congenital ectodermic dysplasia is a rare hereditary disorder, and it can cause um, dysplasia of the eye, fingers, toes, nerves, all that sort of stuff. Charlie M syndrome, on the other hand, is a hypogenesis syndrome. So if people tend to be missing limbs or fingers or or things like that, it there have only been about five recorded cases of Charlie M syndrome, and they think it is due to a failure of oral abortive pills during the pregnancy. So not a lot is known about this other than it's, it's uh, si clinical signs and symptoms, but there's uh, a picture and a couple of those listed for you there. So our case history Patient's 35-year-old male referred from an oculoplastic service for a scleral lens evaluation of the right eye. He does have both of those conditions I just listed, and the way that he was affected was with hypodactyly. So he had two digits per hand. He had a thumb and a finger, kind of like that, and that, that's about it. His ocular history was already positive for limbal stem cell deficiency, a symblepheron of the right eye, and complete conjunctivalization of the left eye. So here's... Oh, and his his medications were not contributory. Um, his vision was 2200 in the right eye and hand motion in the left with everything else being normal. Slit lamp findings were here, but I'm just going to pop ahead to the, the pictures, get you a better idea. Here's what the patient looked like in primary gaze on the left and opening his eyes as wide as possible on the right. The slit lamp photos of the right eye reveal some blepharon. The right lower lid was attached completely to the conjunctiva. And his left eye was completely conjunctivalized with also some blepharons. So like you're thinking, I was thinking the same thing. What do you want me to do? So I quickly Google this condition, figure out what everything is, pretend like I already knew what it was. It turns out he's not really a good candidate for contact lenses, considering he doesn't have a fornix in the right eye and he's completely conjunctivalized in the left. So I did the thing everyone does and run out of the room and talk to your friends. Thankfully, our oculoplastics team was right down the hall and we kind of came up with maybe a harebrained idea. What if we created a fornix for this patient? Would he be a contact lens candidate then? So this is what I saw the day after post fornix creation surgery. Turns out the patient had spontaneously perforated his cornea during the fornix creation and had an emergency PK. You can also see some amnion graft sutured into the conjunctiva there. And his visual acuity is now count fingers at three feet. So not exactly what I was hoping for <laughs> on the, on the post-op there. So just like what I'm hoping everyone else is thinking, I thought I'm supposed to fit that. Like I thought we were gonna be able to fit a contact after this. So after I said, it's not possible, I talked with one of my mentors, Christine Sint, 
And she said, oh, of course you can fit something like that. Let's let's go. Let's work on it together. So we ended up fitting with a modified iPrint Pro. So that circle with the blue is a, considered a perfect circle. And that tray is signifying that this was, is what's called an ovate lens. So it's not circular. It's oval shaped to get maximum coverage in the nasal and temporal periphery. Here's the initial lens dispense. And uh, his vision did improve to about 2300 with that. In the, and this is all right eye. We're not talking about the left eye at all on this one. However, when we did the OCT, there was complete touch all the way across. So we ordered a new lens, got, and as that lens was coming in, the patient wasn't able to come back, unfortunately, for another month. The lens was keeping his ocular inflammation down. So despite the touch, we dispensed it anyway. And unfortunately, he developed a corneal abrasion. And I thought this was just a super cool picture because you can actually see the abrasion in the OCT. But so because of that, we refit him. And that's what this OCT is showing. So you can see the lens over top there with, with much more clearance all the way across the cornea, a uh, much better fit. Um, the reason for the, the touch beforehand was when there's an eye this inflamed, its conjunctival shape is changing almost multiple times per day. So no matter what you get for the first thing, you're going to have to change it. So a good point there, Marcus, that I was kind of kind of almost go back to my initial dispense kind of talk that we had previously too. getting patient expectations for these as well, too, whenever sometimes they think they're coming to you with an immediate answer. Obviously, this is the most complicated of complex, <laughs> but having them know that you these lenses aren't designed just to correct their vision. A lot of times they're healing what's going on underneath it. So that, in, I mean, night and day difference looking at this eye compared to the day you saw it. So clearly the lens is going to fit differently, setting those patient expectations that it's going to change. And this is a, a long work in progress for sure. Yeah, great point, Brian. And I actually, that was made clear to the patient. And to take it even one step further, the corneal surgeon sent him back to me as a Hail Mary saying, hey, man, I just used whatever graft I could. I consider this a non-optical graft. He he didn't expect the patient to get vision back out of it. So this was purely to save the eye at this point. But as as we did um, adjust the fit and, and continue on with management, that epi defect did resolve. So this is a little bit of different picture, but I that red arrow is pointing out where that defect was. Um, that blue dashed line is trying to show where the lens was to prove there's still clearance because the uh, red lines created by the OCT are not correct. But so he's getting better. Um, here is the final lens. And I really like this picture because almost the only way you can tell there's a lens on there is because of that bubble up near his upper eyelid. But yeah, this is his eye. And first off, you can just tell how much quieter that eye is. There's way, way less inflammation. Um, he still has some scarring, haze, all that sort of stuff. But this is this is a definite improvement. So the, the final lens that we used parameters here. Again, this is another one when you want to use as high of a DK lens as you possibly can um, to promote that, that corneal health, that ocular surface health. And his vision was 2100. And then he got to 2070, 2050, and actually ended up at 2030 with this lens. Um, he was able to go back to work. He told me that he beat his girlfriend in Call of Duty the other day, which was really cool. Anytime I can get someone better at video games, you know, I'm down for that. Um, but so this this turned out way better than I thought until he showed up a year later. So I've been seeing him in between these points, but unfortunately, his condition just worsened. So again, back to another Hail Mary. What can we do to help fix fix this? Um, just in an attempt to get as much, much oxygen to that surface as possible, I actually fenestrated the, off, the lenses in office, which is very nerve wracking when you're drilling holes into your patient's um, very expensive lens. But it went well until he we had another little conjunctival abrasion. And we weren't able to tell if that was due to the contact lens itself or just due to the highly changing corneal surface. But either way, just to be safe, we we decided the chance of salvaging this eye is low. 
So we got ahead of the patient and, and told him, hey, man, th this things are getting worse. We don't know if it's going to get better. We want you to, to function on how to be legally blind ahead of time in case it comes down to this. So he actually ended up having to take Braille classes and, and use a, um, a cane and all of that sort of stuff. He was highly motivated. He's one of those people that doesn't like just sitting around. And, and he understood he had, he had gotten over a year and a half of wear with that previous lens doing really well. Um, and we decided to do one last fit for him, something to just try and keep the eye as stable as possible. So we did an impression refit with fenestrations, just like we did before. And here's the OCT images on that. So um, that that top it, picture there, you can see there is clearance. Hopefully you can tell that even over that irregular nodule of scarring on the left hand side. And then on that bottom picture, we can see that it's definitely, definitely clearing over that area where the con abrasion was present. Final uh, visual acuity, unfortunately, was hand motion in this eye, even with all of this. But so the point that I want to I want to make is a lot of times when patients come to you, they're coming from corneal surgeons or from people who you, this is the last hope. If a scleral doesn't work, nothing does. So even when the eyes look crazy, sometimes you got to get a little um, ingenuity or, or even if you're not comfortable, send to one of your friends or talk to your mentors and find a way, find someone who can help. Um, then another key point, tailor your expectations, just like Brian was saying, if you think there's a chance this can head south, warn the patients in advance. They want to be prepared for things rather than getting the, the surprise. And a lot of times they handle it a lot better than you might think. Last thing, sometimes everything is still not enough. There's a disease or a condition going on under these eyes. And sometimes just putting a piece of plastic on the eye isn't enough to save it. So do the best you can, but sometimes everything is still not enough. Don't take that as a personal indictment on you as a scleral fitter. So you just gotta know, do the best you can. And if you think that someone else can do too better, talk to them or try and try and um, talk with your colleagues. So I want to give a, a special shout out to David Slater for providing those eye print images and then also the rest of the University of Iowa team. We have a great team over there. And I will now answer any of your questions. Please tailor yeah, them. Shout out my staff too. Yeah, shout out Brian's staff. And uh, please ask questions to me only, not Brian, since I'm going to be here live fielding them. I'm just kidding. You can ask questions about Brian's cases too and I'll just make stuff up.